So armed with general relativity, theorists were able to explore cosmology. The first to do so was de Sitter in 1917. He produced a universe that contained only vacuum energy. But it was realized after a few years that this predicted Hubble's law. And in fact, this prediction was very influential. A number of astronomers before Hubble, leading up to Hubble's paper, which was the most comprehensive of these analyses in 1929, discovered or tested this prediction. So although Hubble's law is often presented as an unexpected surprise, in fact, the theoretical context led people to look for a re result of this form. It's interesting to speculate how long its discovery might have taken otherwise. But of course, the most general universe contains more than just vacuum. And this was solved by the Soviet physicist Friedman in 1922 to 24. Friedman reached a number of remarkable conclusions, the most important of which was what we today call the Big Bang. What this means is that if you make a plot versus time of the size of the universe. I don't need to say exactly what I mean by that, just pick some piece of the universe, plot how big it is versus time. Here it is, it's getting bigger now, we know that. Solving the equations given him by Einstein, Friedman showed that in the past this would have emerged from a singularity. And the time between the singularity and today is about 1 over Hubble's constant, which today is 14 billion years. So Einstein's dynamics had given us the strange conclusion that the universe was only a finite time. The other remarkable conclusion of Friedman's work was that the matter content of the universe affected its curvature. Think about the Earth. This is what would be called a closed surface, by which I mean that it's finite. You can walk around it forever, you never come to a boundary, but you come back to your starting point. So the universe can be closed and have what's called positive curvature. Three-dimensional space can be curved in exactly the same sense. But what Friedman also showed was that you could have negative curvature. Now, I can't draw you a picture of what that means, but curvature means that straightforward geometry doesn't apply, for example. We know that the sum of these three angles adds up to 180 degrees. That's not true in curved space. But the negative curved, un curved universe is what's called an open universe, and it would be infinite. So unlike a closed universe, which is finite, a universe of negative curvature would go on forever. And it's the density of the universe that turns one of these into another. There's a critical density. Which is minute. It's about one atom per cubic meter. It's a better vacuum than we can make anywhere on Earth. But that's enough material to turn 
an open universe into one that closes back in on itself. And every now and then you might see this symbol omega, which is the density, divided by this critical value. And so we would say that omega equals one tells us that you're in a universe at the boundary between open and closed, which is flat. And strangely enough, from modern observations, this is where we seem to be. One of the ways that we learn about the early stages of the expanding universe is the fact that it was hot. So anybody who owns a bike appreciates this. As you pump up your tires, you compress the air, it becomes hot. So the temperature of material in the expanding universe is actually proportional just to one over the, the size of the universe. The smaller it is, the higher the temperature. This means at early times, the temperatures can be really extreme. So when the universe is about one minute old, the temperature is about a billion degrees. This means that nuclear reactions can happen. So atomic, so nuclei can be assembled. So at higher temperatures, they couldn't survive. So you had individual protons and neutrons. But as the universe cools below this threshold, these can come together to make a deuterium nucleus. And two deuterium nuclei can come together to make helium. Now what we see in the universe today is that all the stars contain roughly 25% by mass of helium. When this was first discovered early in the 20th century, it was unexplained. But it was then realized that this was an inevitable prediction of nuclear reactions in the early universe. Furthermore, by looking at the relic abundance of deuterium, you can measure the density of all ordinary material that participates in nuclear reactions today. And the answer is it's something like 5% of the critical density. Remember, omega equals one was a universe that was flat. So ordinary atomic material, we can be sure, was being synthesized at the time when the universe was about one minute old. And we know today it's far short of closing the universe. Now, a more direct way of probing the early hot universe is the fact that we can see it. If we look far enough away, we can see directly back to a time when the universe had that temperature. So there's radiation left over in the universe. that comes from great distances. It's from a, a shell known as the last scattering shell. And that's because at great distances, corresponding to early times, as we look at it, material was ionized so that light can't propagate freely. It temperatures thousands of Kelvin. It's just like the um, the surface of the sun. But eventually the universe cools to the point where atoms form. That is, say for example, with, heat, with hydrogen, you have a proton and an electron come together to make a single atom of hydrogen. That doesn't scatter light so effectively and then the radiation can propagate to see us. So over here, it's say 3000 Kelvin, but it's at great distances and the expansion of the universe redshifts it. And by the time it reaches us, it's a, rare, a mere 2.7 Kelvin. So radiation of such a low temperature is characterized by radio waves at a wavelength of something like one millimeter. This is the, um, the so-called CMB stands for Cosmic Microwave Background. And this was found in 1960, well, 1964, published in 65. 
by Penzis and Wilson, who received the Nobel Prize for this work, even though it was a complete accident. And it's a strange irony that elsewhere in the world, groups who understood this cosmological transition had predicted the existence of radiation and were preparing to search for it. In any case, it is there, and we can see back, therefore, to this era where the time is something like four, 400,000 years after the Big Bang. So we can get this close to the initial singularity with direct observations, and that's extremely powerful.